Let me introduce you to yourself. You are stained. You have sealed your isolated separation with guilt. Let me introduce you to yourself. You are under the shroud of slavery. In trying to own yourself, you became owned. Your master is your sin. You serve nothing but your own isolation and separation. This is your identity. This is who you are. But let me introduce you to who he is. He is God's special possession. There is no shroud of darkness on him. Yet he fell under the dark veil of death so that God might specially possess us. He is the holy nation. He is perfect and the fullness of God's kingdom. Yet he left his kingdom of purity to take on our impurity. He tarnished his holiness by becoming sin for us. He is the royal priesthood. There was no distance between himself and God, yet the royal one was struck for our separation. He took the blow for our absence. He is the chosen one. Before the foundations of the earth, he chose to stand alone to bring us to God. That is who he is. That is the identity of Jesus.
So let me introduce you to who you are now. You are now the chosen people. No longer alone, you have been brought into a full and eternal family with God himself as your father and the Prince of Peace as your brother. Now the royal priesthood. You are the sons and daughters of the King who stand as a beacon of light to a separated world that there is hope and there is access to the Father. Let me introduce you to who you are now. You are now the holy nation. You have been sprinkled with the blood of God's perfect Son so that now all His goodness, all His righteousness, all His perfection is credited to you. Let me introduce you to who you are now. You are now God's special possession. You have been sealed for salvation. You have been protected with perseverance. He who bought you with his blood will never let you fall away, for he loves you and he owns you. This is who you were. This is who he is. This is who you are now. This is your identity. And Father, we want to thank you for our identity in Jesus Christ, that we belong to you and you belong to us. And thank you, Lord, for the close relationship that you want to have with us. Lord, thank you that we're always on your mind. And Father, I pray that every single person in the building would realize they are loved by God, the one who knows everything about you and still loves you. Father, I pray, God, that you would draw us closer to yourself. Help us, Lord, to realize as we start this series on what it means to be fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would use it for your honor and glory, God. I pray that you would anoint me, Lord. I pray, God, that you would, your Holy Spirit will work and touch every single heart, Lord God, that we would leave filled with understanding more of what surrender is all about. Father, I just thank and praise you for all that you're going to do to bring glory to yourself today. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Our new series is entitled Total Surrender. And what we want to do is not only look at this from the Word of God, but we're going to do something unique. We want to look at it from the eyes of the early church, from the eyes of the 12 disciples, from the eyes of the first believers and Christians. And how is it that they understood the gospel? How is it that they understood what it meant to really follow Jesus Christ and to be totally surrendered to him? Because one thing we realize is the fact that the church of Jesus Christ is to be used in order to bring about change in the world. And how can God bring change in the world unless it begins with us? And so what we're going to look at is part one is total surrender equals taking up your cross. But what exactly does that mean? Well, from Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus Christ says something to Peter. And he says, and I tell you, Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What's significant is the geography of this particular scene. Jesus Christ decides to take his disciples to a place called Philippi. And at this place of Caesarea Philippi, the place in which there was a lot of foes worship that was going on at the time. And in this place of foes worship, where people did just some crazy things in the form of worship, Jesus Christ brings them here. And the disciples are probably wondering, what are you doing, Jesus? Why are you bringing us to this pagan place? You see, this place was known as the actual gates of of hell. And the reason why is because at this particular place there was a huge cave that was there which was believed to be the place where Baal or Pan 
the main gods that they worship at the time will go into the cave during the winter and then come out of the cave during the springtime in order to bring the harvest. So this was truly known as the gates of hell. Everything evil symbolized this particular geographical spot. In fact, even before the time of Christ, they would take babies, literally, they would take sons and throw them in the cave alive as a sacrifice unto the gods. And if that baby came out from underneath through the water that will come and then come from underneath the cave, it means that that child was rejected, that it wasn't a good offering and the gods were not happy with the sacrifice. But if the baby disappeared, it therefore meant that it was acceptable. Can you imagine how desperate people were? And Jesus Christ brings them to the place where there was a place where they would worship Caesar as God, a place that they would worship Pan as God and goats, a place where they will have an altar and there will be sexual things that would take place on the altar in the name of religion. All of this stuff would take place here at this particular area. And Jesus Christ brings them here to teach them a lesson, and it's this. I tell you, Peter, and on this rock, this place, this bedrock, not only in regards to himself, Jesus Christ, but also in regards to the place where they were, which was bedrock. I will build my church and the gates of hell themselves shall not prevail against it. They would not be able to stop what I'm about to do. Jesus Christ basically is making three points in this verse. First of all, Christ will have a church in this world. That's the first thing that he stated. I am going to build a church. This was about 2,000 years ago. And I want to tell you, 2,000 years later, right now in 2022, the church is still alive. And the church is still real. And the church is still marching. Second thing was that his church will be severely attacked. That's why he says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. They're going to try the attack against the church of Jesus Christ throughout church history, continues even today. It's just a lot of it just simply goes unreported because the world, for the most part, hates Christians. And number three, none of the devil's attacks will destroy the church of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a blessing? That no matter what the enemy tries to do, Jesus Christ will always have the victory. Let's put our hands together and praise the Lord for that. That's a powerful point. So Jesus is helping us to realize that his church is going to march and his church is going to go forth. So when these people would accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior, what was the church facing at the time? If you accepted Jesus Christ as your, in the first century, there are certain things that will be against you immediately. First of all, the Judaizers. There were those who wanted to hold on to the law, and they didn't want to believe in Jesus Christ. They were holding on to different things like circumcision and various other practices and saying this is the way to righteousness and that Jesus Christ is false, he is not false, he is not real. And so the Judaizers would come up against the church and they will come up against the church. You have people like Paul who was known as Saul before who wanted to do it legally through the government to put people to death. And in prison if they said they belong to Jesus. So Judaizers, Saul's old crew, was continuing on. Secondly, there were Greek enemies as well. Those that were Greeks did not want to follow the ways of Jesus Christ. Because the Greek way, the stuff that they did, my goodness, there was no way that there was, many of them would believe in Jesus or wanted to accept Jesus. Because that meant they would have to change their lives. They lived however they wanted. Second, third, there were the Roman enemies as well. Romans were enemies, not all of them, but some. But the Roman enemies were because of the fact that Caesar was seen as God. So you had to hail Caesar. Hail Caesar because he was seen as God. And Christians couldn't do that because the only person that they should worship according to the scriptures is who? Jesus Christ. They can't go and bow before Caesar as a God and worship him. That was a problem. On top of that, there were Greco-Roman worshipers. Those who either took the gods from the Greeks and made them a bit Roman and changed their names. But it was the same stuff that was going on in which they did not want anything to do with Jesus Christ. So sometimes when the 
idol worshipers. Their profit went down because people were accepting Christ. Riots would break out in the city. Attacks would happen. They would try to put even their early disciples in prison as a result. Same thing that's happening in Ethiopia right now, by the way. You should pray for them. And then constant persecution. Constantly. Running from your house at times. Sometimes having to say goodbye to your family and not knowing when you will see them again. In some of these cases, as they will come and raid the house, there will be even people that would escape and families get broken up and then you don't know where the rest of your family is. Imagine the stress of that. Things that the early believers would endure. So in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, then Jesus told his disciples, and the reason why is because Jesus was like the circus. The circus, for the most part, like Barnum and Bailey, they come into a city for a period of time. They set up shop. They sell tickets. They do their performance. And then they pack things down, and they move to the next city. Jesus was like the circus for many people. It was a fad whereby you come and you say, okay, well, tell us, you know, let's see what it's going to do next. Last time we got a free fish sandwich. It was just better than our mouse. It had tartar sauce and everything on it. And what are we going to get this time? That's when he fed the 5,000 men plus women and children. It was fish and bread. You put it together. Isn't that a fish sandwich, chef? I think so. Fish sandwiches Jesus was giving out. People were like, yes, and half the, you can read it for yourself in the scriptures, the next day they showed up because of the meal, the free food they got. You want to grow a service? Give out some free food. <laughs> so what happens is that things are happening where Jesus is sort of like the new circus in town, and many people were excited about it. They wanted to know what was he going to do next. He heard that he did miracles, and some were genuine in regards to seeking, and many were not. So Jesus decides to call the disciples to himself. In some cases, in the other gospel, it's like he stops the crowd and says, hold up a second. I want you to realize something. All of you want to jump on the bandwagon, but realize this, that if anyone, not some people, not a select few, but if anyone will come after me, you want to follow me and be part of this? Let him deny himself and take up his cross and then follow me. There was a prerequisite in order to follow Jesus. And the prerequisite was first of all self-denial. Secondly, to take up your cross. And third, to follow Jesus. A prerequisite simply because, remember when you take courses in university, there's a prerequisite to the course that you may want to take. Which means you can't start this course without taking the course before it. And Jesus Christ was saying, you want to get to the point of following me, but there's a couple of prerequisites that you have to do in which one leads to the other. And the first one is that you have to deny yourself. Once you deny yourself, then you can take up your cross because you can't take up your cross if you haven't denied yourself first. And you can't follow Jesus unless you take up your cross. You see the prerequisites? So in the order that Jesus Christ is speaking as to what it does it mean to follow Jesus and what is total surrender about, the first thing he says is this, it's self-denial. I want to tell you something. Most people think that their main enemy is the devil and their main enemy are unbelievers. You know who your main enemy is? Yourself. Because yourself gets yourself into trouble all the time. The devil as powerful as he may be at times, cannot make you do anything. He needs your cooperation in order to get things done. If you're going to be depressed, you can't do it just by the devil. The devil needs you to cooperate. If you're going to sin, it's not just you. It needs The devil also needs you to submit to what he's trying to put before you. So all of the compromise and all of that. So the first thing Jesus says, and the early church understood this stuff because they had to live it every day. To stand up for Jesus and to say you were a Christian, it wasn't like today where you might get a pat on the back and people get excited. That's the world I'm talking about. Yes, the church will, but not the world. People in families get ostracized other people. People in Ethiopia today, they accept Jesus Christ, especially in a place like Dera Dawa, which is 93 to 95% Muslim. They get disowned. 
by the entire family. We were teaching pastors in this area. And every time I go and fly into this area, I'm sensitive to the fact of the persecution that's all around. And I'm thinking, there's a walk that we have to do from the, from the place where we stay, from the hotel there to the, to the facility. It's about a, maybe a five-minute walk. And as I'm walking, I'm, I'm just thinking, like, what do these people think? These Christians coming in here and teaching our people, you know, people on the outskirts. But about 30 minutes away, a 30-minute drive, they're about 20 to 30 minutes away. If I were to walk in that area and try to share the gospel, this is just 30 minutes from where this hotel is, there's a great probability I will be stoned on the spot, like Old Testament, first century, New Testament style stoning because of the fact that they don't want you to be bringing Jesus up in this place. This belongs to Allah, not to Jesus Christ. So the first step is to deny yourself. But this is how these guys, this is how they live. And those who live like this, Jesus Christ is very real because they have Jesus and nothing else. As a result, they see the works of God and they see God do miraculous things all of the time. I mean, I was sharing with you and I asked Ray Noah, God willing, who may be here next year, like, tell me, why is it that they experience so much of God's hand and on the western side of the world we don't? He says, well, you know what? They have Jesus and nothing else. We, this is what he says. We have Jesus and our medicine cabinet. We have Jesus and our doctors. We have Jesus and our insurance. We have Jesus and our MRIs. We have Jesus and so many other things. They have Jesus and nothing else. No distractions is all about Jesus Christ. I wish I could take every single one of you on one of these trips so that you can just be there when they just worship God and when they call on God and they pray. You would sense the power of of Jesus is all of who they're holding on to. The first century, no doubt, was the same way. The first thing they had to do was deny themselves. So what does it mean to deny yourself? Titus chapter 2 gives us an indication. It means that you need more of the grace of God. It says, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. That means for those who have accepted Jesus Christ, they have the grace of God has appeared to you. And it offers salvation to you, to everybody. Salvation, if you've accepted Christ, you've experienced salvation. And it, talking about the grace based on the noun, it, the subject, it teaches us to say, what's the next word? Shout it out for me, please. No. no. To what? Ungodliness and what? But isn't this the world system? So that means, this is what the scriptures teach anyway, that there are times in which you may want to do something ungodly. Or when you want to follow your worldly passions. And to be, have no self-control. But notice what it says, the grace of God teaches us to say what? No. So the only way you can deny yourself is by God's grace. Is by the love of God, knowing that God loves you so much. So there are certain things that you don't do because of your love for God. And it's not a question. that You don't do it because you're in love with God. The same thing that if you're a married couple and you have a good marriage, there are certain things you're just not going to do because you love your spouse. He says it teaches us God's love, God's grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this what? Right now. In 2022, you can live for God and be on fire for God with all of the mess that's around you in the world. Isn't that awesome? It's only by the grace of God, though. Not by your strength. It's by God's grace. So the early church realized this. So sometimes we can think this. People... In the first century, had it easy. Why? Because they just saw Jesus, you know, Jesus Christ just, it was easy to believe in Jesus. They didn't have no real problems. You know, the church was growing. Everything was great. Not if you read the Bible. So what did they go through? The second thing he says is this, to deny himself. And what's number two? Take up your cross. 
You see, this has lost a lot of its weight today because the cross is seen as something glorious. You know, something that we wear around for earrings and around our neck. We have crosses and it looks so beautiful. But that's because of we were moved 2,000 years ago from what the cross really meant. You see, it'll be like if you wore a cross in the first century, it'll be like wearing a gun today around your neck. It's a form of execution, something that's going to kill somebody. Or maybe it's a noose that you would wear in the first century. Or maybe it's a sword, something that was known to kill people. This wasn't just something that was nice. Or maybe lethal injection needle is what you would wear. You get the idea? But now what we've do is we've, we've taken the cross and made it into something beautiful. But in reality, the cross always meant death. The Romans came up with a way to bring about an execution. You see, prior to this point in time, people were execute people, yes, but usually you know how they would do it? With a sword. That was the normal way, especially in the Middle East, of execution. It was a sword, and usually if you wanted someone got the death sentence, they were beheaded. They usually would hold their head over Bend them over, they'll be tied behind their back on their knees. They put their head over a basket. And someone who knew how to do it with their sword that was extremely sharp would take off the head of the individual. It was quick. This is what it usually was like. Or if you pierce someone with a sword in war, again, they knew how to pierce someone in order to execute them quickly. The same thing takes place even in regards to how police officers are tra trained, they're trained to shoot, not to wound. You would think, well, why don't they just shoot them in the leg? That's not how they're trained. They're always trained to shoot, to kill the person. If you're shooting them, the point is to kill them. Execution, then they came up with the, the, the lethal injection. Before that, it was electrical. Remember that? They were electrocute people. They try to come up with stuff that will be fairly quick. The Romans, however, perfected this whole form of execution by making it something that would take very long. That's what they wanted. They wanted the person to be shamed, and they wanted the person to die slowly. That's what the crucifixion was all about. So what the Lord says is this. Deny yourself. And take up your cross. Now he mentions this before he himself goes to the cross. He's saying you now realize what total surrender means when you come to me. Is first of all you got to deny yourself stuff. And then you have to take up your cross. Which has a twofold meaning. It has a spiritual meaning and also a literal meaning. Spiritually is dying to yourself. And taking up your cross, meaning you taking up the life of Jesus Christ, his death and his life, and allowing the life of Christ to live through you. But it also has a literal meaning as well, which means you have to be willing in order to die for Jesus Christ if necessary. You love him to the point of death so that you don't hold on to your life so much. The problem today is people love life too much. They love themselves too much. They love their phones too much. They love their statuses too much. To the point whereby it takes them away from Jesus Christ in a relationship with him. These guys, Romans, came up with what's called the crucifixion whereby you would die a slow death. The nails in the hands and the nails in the feet had nothing to do with loss of blood. It was to get you to a point of exhaustion and also to a point where you could not breathe unless you moved. And when you have these nails in your hands and the pressure that's on them and, and in your feet and you have to lift yourself up in order to exhale, then you have an idea of what it's like. That's how difficult it was or to breathe. That's what was necessary because you had to move up and down the cross because of all the gases that filled on the outside of the lungs. It was difficult for you to breathe. So the more you can move your legs with that excruciating pain in your feet is the longer that you could stay alive. And so there was a battle between yourself and your mortality. 
How long do I want to stay alive? Depends on how long you can endure. How, how strong your willpower was to try and stay alive, knowing you were going to die anyway. The point was to get to the point in which you just gave up. And that could take hours to do. That's what the cross was about. These early Christians and these people in the first century, when Jesus gave this type of teaching, they were like, what? I thought you were going to be the guy who comes and brings in the kingdom, like the guy that's going to overthrow the Roman government. Why do we have to take up a cross for? That means death. Jesus, what are you teaching in regards to your standard of what the gospel means, that I have to deny myself, first of all. Secondly, that I have to take up my cross. So the point of exhaustion in which you then gave up and you would just die. Or if you still were battling and the Romans were just getting tired because they had to take out their family, Roman soldiers, oh, it's time for me to knock off. They would come and get a club and they would break your legs because break your legs means that you would suffocate. Suffocating means you would die. That's what they try to do to the thieves. Remember when they came to break his leg, their legs and they did, but with Jesus Christ, he had already given up his spirit. So not a bone was broken according to the prophecy that was given in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ would die on the cross for us and says, so Jesus says, so you want to be my disciple? You want to be my disciple, which means follower? Deny yourself. Secondly, take up your cross. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find out what life is all about. Twofold meaning again, on earth, if you want to save your life and hold on to the things of life and your pleasures and your desires and your agenda, then you're going to lose what living is all about. But if you lose your life in the will of God and what he wants for you, then you're going to find out what true living is all about. So we have an opportunity now to know what it means to truly live if we allow God to be number one in our lives. And then lastly, he says this, if anyone comes after me and deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. This is what following Jesus means. He basically says, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. That's what love is all about, the love for Jesus Christ. He says, in fact, this is love. This is love for God to keep his commands. And notice what it says next. Let's all read this together. Are you ready? Because it's an important point. And his commands are not burdensome. Why? Most times we have heard and probably even felt that to follow Jesus is too hard. To be a committed Christian is too difficult. God's asking us to do something that's too great. But notice what the word of God tells us. If you love the Lord, you're going to follow his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. They're not too heavy. When you have the grace of God, it makes following Jesus lighter. When you have the grace of God, you can get through difficult situations and keep trusting in God even while you're going through a trial. So what we need more is more of God's love and more of God's grace because his commands are not too hard. His commands are not burdensome. And then in John chapter 6, verse 46, he says, So why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? To follow Jesus is to do what Jesus asks you to do for all of us. That's what following Jesus Christ is all about. So what Jesus Christ says is, what I want you to do is to deny yourself, to take up your cross, and to follow me. This is what total surrender was all about. So there were 12 disciples. And what we want to do in this series is look at these disciples and what it meant for them to follow Jesus. Jesus called 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. They had the works and the power of God. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So there are the 12 disciples. 
And what we hardly ever do is study these guys and figure out, well, what is it that they went through in life? And what was it like for them to follow Jesus Christ? So in each week, what we're going to do is give you an element of what total surrender looks like and then look at it in the lives of the early church and then also a modern person today or in our lifetime for the most part or maybe in the previous century, but not too far away. First of all, there's Jesus Christ. Jesus leads by example as to what it means to follow God and to total surrender. Jesus Christ, in totally surrendering and serving us, gave us his life. Jesus Christ died on that cross. He was buried. He rose again. He gave us his life. Jesus is the one who died on the cross for us. So that's why Jesus can say, you got to deny yourself. you got to take up your cross, and you've got to follow me. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was there, what was he doing? Denying himself. God made this cup pass for me, but not my will. Your will be done. I don't want to go through this, God, Father. But yet, can you please allow the cup to pass, this cup of suffering? But then again, not what I want is what you want. Denying himself. Take up his cross. Did Jesus go to the cross? Yes. He got a double whammy. In fact, he got the 39 lashes plus the cross. Usually people would get one or the other, the 39 lashes, and sometimes they let you go because Pilate thought if I give him the 39 lashes and the people see how messed up he is, they surely would, would allow him to go free. Pilate was doing his best to try and get Jesus off the hook. And then when that didn't work, he says, okay, well, I will let the serial killer on the streets again. I'm sure you don't want Barabbas to be set free. So who do you want, Barabbas, or do you want Jesus? And what did they say? Give us Barabbas, but crucify him. None of the plans that Pilate had worked. So he washes his hands and says, okay, go ahead and go ahead with the execution. Jesus Christ died for us, leading on an example But what we want to do is we want to track the order of the people as they were suffered and what they went through in regards to their form of total surrender. And the first guy we need to talk about is Stephen. Stephen was brave. Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was a young man. He accepted Jesus Christ as his personal savior. And after accepting Jesus Christ, they called him up and says, this guy is causing trouble. This guy is out there preaching the gospel. And so... (laughs) <laughs> Stephen has enough. You stiff-necked people, he says. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised, figuratively speaking. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, and now you have betrayed and murdered him? You have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Isn't that powerful? It's like Jesus, the word of God tells us, is sitting at the right hand of the Lord. But just before Stephen is about to die, Jesus stands up. Probably walks forward a bit and looks down at the first martyr, other than Jesus Christ, of the church. The first guy that was going to lead to many other martyrs of those who would give their lives for Jesus. And Jesus Christ is there looking down at him and the Lord allows him to see the Lord, to see Jesus. He saw Jesus standing at the right hand of, of God. Look, he says, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. I see Jesus, the resurrected one. The Lord allows him to see this because remember Jesus Christ ascended and there were some that were saying that didn't really happen. He says, but I see him right now. And they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices. Imagine how much they hated Jesus. And they rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him as they're taking up these rocks and just stoning Stephen. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man, young guy, probably in his late teens, by the name of Saul. We know who he is, right? 
While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, just like Jesus did. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knew this was the end. And he fell at his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. When he said this, he fell asleep. He died. This is the first guy. And this is what led to a wave of persecution in which we got away with one guy. Let's go after the rest of them. Which brings us to James. This is James, the son of Zebedee. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, however, the brother of John, the one we've been studying, the apostle John, put to death with the sword. So this is the first one out of the 12 disciples to go is James. James was because of this guy by the name of King Agrippa, not to be associated with the King Herod or the one that you may be familiar with because different of them had names Agrippa. But this was the King Agrippa the first, And then here's the one who then dies. King Agrippa the first of Judea gives him the sentence, execute him. He died by being beheaded. This was James. This is the son of Zebedee and the brother of John was his oldest brother. James is the one who dies because of his commitment to Jesus Christ. And there he dies on the cross. And you know what's interesting? Is that he dies on his way. There was a historian at the time. And the historian was Clemens Alexandrinus. And he was a guy who would write historical facts about what took place in the first century. And this is what he wrote about in regards to James. The Bible doesn't tell us. History books tell us that James was on his way to his execution, being beheaded because of the order of King Agrippa I of Judea. And on his way, there was a guy who captured him because he worked, obviously, for Rome. Some say he was even a Roman soldier, but he had worked for him, for the Roman government, and he captured him because he had to follow the law. What did the law say? Go get him and bring him and execute him. So he was got James, and he's dragging him out to go to his execution in order to get beheaded. The problem, however, was this Roman soldier who was the one who, was his, the one who captured him in order to execute him as he's following the law, of Rome is an undercover Christian, is a believer. He is so convicted by James's bravery and focus and love for Jesus Christ that he falls to his knees. This is what the hist- historical account tells us. He falls to his knees and confesses, first of all, to James, I'm a Christian too. And because of that, they were beheaded together. You see what total surrender meant in the first century? Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow Jesus. And they were both executed at the same time. And as we close, a modern one, in 1904 to 1905, there was a famous thing that took place that you may not have heard about, but we should all know about. It's the Welsh Revival in England, in Wales. It was the largest Christian revival in Wales in the 20th century. In fact, most of the mega churches, even in the United States and mega churches in different parts of the world, attribute where they are based on this revival. And they track... Uh, what they call church history. And this is a major revival that takes place in England. In fact, what was amazing as people wrote about this is they were saying there was no advertisement given for these meetings that would take place. And there will be thousands of people that will come together in order to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And thousands of people end up getting saved in the first two months of this revival that took place because of people praying. In the first two months, 
70,000 people accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And this is what would happen, by the way. It says many young people, those in their 20s, entered the mission fields of India and the Orient, Africa, and Latin America to go as missionaries sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Getting on a boat, going to these particular places in order to tell people about Jesus. Totally surrendered, gave their lives for the gospel. Most missionaries, by the way, who ended up going into these places in the 19th century, most of them were in the, either the late teens or early 20s. And they gave their lives for Jesus Christ. Young adults. Well, uh, some of these people went to India. It was the northern part of India. And there is what's called the Naksing and family of the Garo tribe. Naksing was the name of a man and the Garo tribe. We don't even have a picture of what this man looks like. This is the Garo tribe sort of most recently in the northern part of India. Well, he heard the words of the missionary that had come from Wales, had given his life, this young guy, and he accepts Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and says, so I need Jesus, so he accepts Christ. But these guys of the Garo tribe in northern India are known as headhunters. They worship false gods. They knew nothing about Jesus Christ, but they know how to kill people. So now his accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. So what does he do? Is he and his wife and his two sons, and he goes around telling people about Jesus. And people are starting to accept Jesus as their personal Savior, which is a big threat to the tribe. So the head of the tribe comes in. This is the head of the tribe. And says, so I want to ask you something. You're going to believe in this Jesus Christ? As our musicians, please come. You're going to believe in Jesus Christ? You're going to accept this Jesus and you're telling other people about Jesus? We don't want Jesus up in here. He says, I follow Jesus. Jesus Christ is my Savior. He says, okay, if that's the case, I am going to give you an opportunity to deny that you know him, to deny Jesus Christ, to turn your back on him. And if you don't do it, if you don't do it, I'm going to execute your two boys. His two little boys were right there, his wife and his two little kids. This man didn't answer with any words of speech, but he simply sang a song that he had written himself. Some of you may know the song, and this is exactly what he sang. Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. He was the one who wrote the song. You know what those guys did? Killed his two boys. The account tells us that his boys were there dying and twitching. The man says, I'm going to give you one more chance. I want you to deny Jesus Christ or we're going to execute your wife. He didn't answer with any words. He just sang the second verse that he had written. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. The head of the chief then gave the order to kill his wife. He executed his wife right before his eyes. 
So his son's dead. His wife is dying. And the chief says, last chance. You deny Jesus Christ. If not, we're going to kill you. Now that his sons had died and his wife had died, he had, his family is gone. He then sings the last verse of the song. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. And the chief feeling he had no other recourse because of what he had said ordered his execution. This new family of the two boys and the father and the wife just were dead there. And so the rest of his family obviously had to come and take up the bodies and do the burial. But something supernatural took place in the heart of the chief. He was so convicted by the Holy Spirit, so taken back by this man, he couldn't get over the fact that he would allow his sons and his wife and himself to die with a man that lived over 2,000 years ago. He says, what is this about? So he started to look into this, and by the Holy Spirit of God, taking away the blindness from his eyes, the chief accepts Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, which allowed the village to accept Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, and the surrounding tribe to accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Can we put our hands together and praise God? But I want to tell you something. This place, this was in the 1900s, early 1900s. This place in northern India today, still is one of the few places in the world that even has a Christian government because like 95% of the people there are saved and know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. How amazing is that? But through the life of this man, he's decided I'm going to fully give myself to Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you today that for the early church what it meant to follow Jesus is that you were willing to die for Jesus it wasn't even like a second thought it was when you accept Christ there's a price to pay when you accept Christ yes we're going to be persecuted because we're going to live for Jesus but Jesus Christ is that real whereby they will go through this type of stuff you see today this is what we treat Jesus as I have here this wheel right we know that the only way for a wheel to move is it needs spokes in it. And most of us, our life is like a wheel. We have to go from one place to another place in order to accomplish things and to get things done. And we feel like we've got to hold it together. How do we hold it together? You need the spokes. And this is what we usually do. We say, so what are the spokes? Well, I need good health. So I do my best to get some good health, you know, to keep myself healthy. Education, one of the spokes. Why? Because you want to have a strong life. You want to get to places and go places. You need a job. So sometimes an education, of course, helps with that. Then I need to take certain trips. Because as Bermudians, you like to go somewhere. Yes. Certain people need a certain type of clothing. We think that's one of the spokes. We think that one of the spokes is, okay, well, some people say, well, settle down, get married, another spoke. Have some children, another spoke. Make sure they have good health. They have a good education. So why? The cycle can continue. One of the spokes, of course, your cell phone. Can't live without that, right? All these spokes that we have. Oh, and then we come to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. He's got to be one of the spokes, right? So let's make Jesus one of the spokes. 
This is how people are today when they accept Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is just one of the things that's part of my life to try and hold my life together. So I just need Jesus to be a part of it. I don't need total commitment to Jesus. It's just got to be there. You know what I mean? I don't need him to be all up in my business. I just need Jesus to be there when I want him to be. It's sort of like driving a car. If your car was your life, the question is, where is Jesus in your car? If you've accepted Jesus Christ, it's like Jesus Christ comes into your car. You got me? So now, if you're a Christian, you have Jesus in your car of life to go to the places where you want to go. So you know what normally happens is that some people, some of us, probably have Jesus Christ in the car, but he's in the trunk. He's in the trunk of the car. You came to church, you parked, you got out of your car, you popped the trunk. Okay, Jesus, church time, get out. Jesus comes to church with you. You had a great time in church. Okay, Jesus, jump back in the trunk. Why? I don't want you all up in my stuff and changing my life. Jump in the trunk, please. Boom. Thank you very much. Let me drive. I'll take you out again next week when I go back to church. No evidence of Christianity from Monday to Saturday. But Sunday, I'll bring you back out. Others of us have Jesus Christ in the back seat. At least it's in the car. So you're driving, but he's in the back seat. He has no influence on where you're going and what you're doing. Other people now, you say, I know you think, you think you know where I'm going, right? Yeah. Next person is in the passenger seat. So, okay, yeah, Jesus, now you can tell me where to turn, but I still want to drive. But where should Jesus Christ be? In the driver's seat. So you get out. You go walk around, you jump in the passenger seat, or best yet, you could get in the back seat and allow Jesus Christ to drive the car of your life, to go where he wants to go, to do what he wants to do, to go to places where you may not even want to go, because he's the one that's driving. The question is this, however, are you a backseat driver? My mother can't drive to save her life. She never drove a car. And whenever we're in the car, she consistently tries to tell me how to drive. I say, but you've never driven before. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. But are you a backseat driver when it comes to Jesus? Oh, what you mean by that? Oh, when Jesus decides to take a turn, and he says, hey, you know what I'm going to do now? I'm going to go down Forgiveness Lane. And he takes the turn down Forgiveness Lane. And you say, no, wait, 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 Jesus. I don't want to go down that lane. Can you please go? Go off. Go off. Take a right. Take a right. That's a backseat driver. He's driving the car. Jesus Christ is driving the car. And then he takes a right turn and he goes down Generous Avenue in regards to your money. Jesus, wait, 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 wait. Where are you going? How much? No, no, no. I just want to go under the radar. I'm the type of person, I don't want no online stuff. I want to give just a physical offering because then I can give $2. You know what I'm talking about? I want to be under the radar, under the radar, low, low. Take it low. And then, therefore, I don't want to go there because I don't want to be generous, no. But Jesus wants you to be. Jesus is driving the car. And Jesus might want to take you down certain roads and avenues that you don't want to go down. But that's what it means to fully surrender to Jesus. To allow him to drive. And don't be a backseat driver. Sit back to the wheel. So now, here's just a spoke. You know what it, the difference between today and the early church? In the early church, Jesus Christ wasn't a spoke. Jesus Christ was the hub that all the other things held on to. Without the hub, the spokes can't even be held together. It's putting Jesus Christ in his rightful place to realize Jesus is our life, and without him, we have absolutely nothing. So because it's the hub, yes, I'm going to deny myself, and I'm going to take up my cross, and I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what, because Jesus Christ is coming back, and only what I do for Jesus Christ is going to last for eternity, because once you start to deny yourself, then you can take up your cross, and once you start taking up your cross, then you can start to follow Jesus. That's what total surrender was in the first century. Let's pray together.
Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for today, and we pray, God, that you would help us, Lord. That when it comes to the wheel of our lives, we will follow you with all of our hearts, oh God. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, for the times in which we focus on things and distractions and all this stuff that we complicate instead of saying, Jesus, help me by your grace to deny myself. That means if there's anything that you're doing, thinking, going, that you know is not in the will of God is to deny self. Your agenda, your plans, what you want to do. Secondly, take up your cross. Being willing to die for the cause of Jesus Christ. To become a bondservant of the gospel of Jesus. To tell other people about, you, about the Lord. Then you can start following Jesus. God, what we want to do is we want to follow you, Lord. We followed our agenda long enough. We followed our will long enough. Jesus, we want to follow you. Is there a price to pay? Of course, there's always a price to pay. But whatever you give up and whatever you lose, you'll be paid back 100 times over in this life. And in the life to come. So the choice is yours. But if you say, you know what? At the beginning of this series, Lord, teach me what it means to follow you. If you show me, Lord, I'll do it by your grace. If you show me, God, I'll do it. What it means to follow you. First of all, I know it means taking up my cross. I need to die to myself. If that's the desire of your heart today, and you say, you know what, God? I want to follow you. I want to know what it means to follow you. Just please just stand wherever you are. Still I will follow just stand wherever you are. Though none go with me, God, bring back the commitment of the early church, God. These early disciples. Now, we're probably not going to get persecuted like they are and get beheaded and crucified. But God, would you give us the same type of love that they had? The same type of commitment, Lord, when it comes to serving you. The same type of commitment when it comes to realizing we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. For everyone who's standing, God, and even for those who may stand during this prayer, I pray, God, that you would help us, each and every one of us, to follow you. Help us, God, to be fully dedicated to you, Jesus, to follow you with all of our hearts, God, because we know that only what we do for you is going to last for eternity, Lord Jesus. Everything else is temporal. This is just the dot that we're living in. But God, there's a whole line that never ends. So God, help us to reprioritize ourselves. Take our eyes off of this earth and keep our eyes on you, Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. So Lord God, I pray that you would hold us to it, Lord God. To follow you. Teach us, Lord, through this series, what it means to totally surrender. God, the early church understood it. Help us, God, to understand it, even though we don't have the same type of persecution. In some countries, they do. But in Bermuda, not as much. But Lord, one thing you did promise, that those who want to live a godly life will be persecuted in one way or another. So it will happen, just maybe on a different type of level. Maybe it's going to be social persecution where people might cut you off and think you're a radical because you're so in love with Jesus. So be it. You're a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So Father, hold us to it, we pray. Hold us to it, Jesus. What we're going to do is just pray and call on the Lord at the same time for His Spirit for his boldness. As Jaden sings the chorus, let us pray. Let's all call on the Lord. Everyone in the building, let's pray. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus 
no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Let's all stand together. Let's all sing it. With me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. Now let's sing the third verse, everyone. The cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. Father, we love you, God. I pray that you will take us all to a new level in you, O oh God. Father, help our love for you to be evident, to be real by, first of all, every single one of us realizing how much you love us. God, just like this gentleman, Lord, Nak Singh, and just like James and Stephen, most importantly, you, Jesus, help us, Lord, to have the same commitment to love you no matter what. This week, help us to apply the word of the Lord, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow you. And we will give you all of the glory. Bring the joy back in our Christian lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we put our hands together in advance and thank the Lord? Let's thank him for his love. God bless you. Have a wonderful day in Jesus Christ. Good morning. We're now going to have online giving. We thank God for those of you who have given thus far to our church. And uh, we're going to pray today that whatever you give online, that God will use that to the building up of the church. And so let us pray. Dear God, in the name of Jesus Christ today, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, oh God, for everything that you have supplied for us. And so, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, even as we give today, I ask in the name of Jesus that it will be used to the building up of your kingdom in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that even as we give, oh God, that you will continue to supply for us our every need, that whatever we ask for in the name of Jesus Christ, it will be done. And so today, once again, we give you thanks because as you supply for us oh god we're able to give unto your kingdom i pray oh god that you bless every hand that gives today in the mighty name of jesus christ and we thank you once again because you are god amen and amen Thank you for being part of an awesome service. I hope you've enjoyed our time with us this week. We look forward to what God is going to do with us next week. Stay tuned to Grace Point. Look out for the notices. We're so awed by and thankful for your presence. And we look forward to what he's going to continue to do in and through your lives. Thank you so much for being a part of Grace Point 